I just don't get it. Like, I mean, it would be one thing if there was another guy. Oh, there is. There's totally another guy. Wow, Christy's driving down to Cyprus to see Patrick. <laughs> I think that's Mike. <laughs> yeah, can you... All right. Okay, Kate, we ready? All set. Okay, welcome everyone to our fourth and last virtual event uh, in 2020. Uh, we pivoted this year and provided uh, student development education virtually this year. And uh, thanks to all of you who have joined us and joined us in the past. It's been a success and we're excited for today's presentation. I'd like to thank all of the panelists for participating today, as well as our committee and our managing director, Kate, uh, for all the hard work that has been put into this year's programming. I am Carolyn Raymond. I am the Student Development Committee Chair and the Director of Human Resources at Cosmos Club and will be your moderator today. So thanks again for joining us. We have a really unique presentation today and I'm really excited to bring these clubs to you. These clubs have very unique missions and purposes and uh, membership and maybe some some clubs that you you know didn't know were out there as a possibility of potential careers for you in the future. I am pleased to introduce Sarah Ford from Army and Navy Club, Gina Zach from Capitol Hill Club, and William McCarran from National Press Club. Now during this presentation you'll be able to ask questions through the chat as many of you are familiar with. Uh, and you can do that as our speakers are speaking. I will help uh, interject and, and ask those questions for you. But after the recording, we are gonna go offline and welcome you all to stay and ask any follow-up questions personally uh, through the Zoom platform. So uh, feel free to stay on after the official presentation and we can have some uh, dialogue uh, that way as well. Thanks again for joining us. And I'm now going to turn it over to William McCarran from uh, National Press Club uh, to start us off. William, take it away. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. And uh, glad to be with all of you. I'm, I'm so uh, happy that you have an interest in, in clubs and in the idea of either city clubs or country clubs as, um, as your careers. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And, and um, I'll tell you a little bit about our, our club, the National Press Club. We're a, a, a club of journalists and public relations professionals. And uh, I, I think I'll just start and then I'll go show you some slides. But start by saying that at most, uh, most clubs or club facilities, if a camera crew from a TV station shows up and starts walking into the club, that would immediately get a call to my position, the, the executive director or the, the, the general manager to sort of stop that or talk to them or find out what's going on. But at the press club, that happens every day. So um, we have uh, uh, a large space uh, that's broken into really I'm going to say three parts. The 13th floor of our build, National Press building is a, a more or less public area where there are lots of news conferences and, and, and events. And then the 14th floor is members only where our, our members um, relax and, and work. And then the fourth floor is a broadcast facility that supports the club. Uh, and I'll, um, I'll share more about that in just a minute. So let's see. You can um, see this. So, uh, so let's see, uh, Carolyn, can they see my screen now, do you think? Yes, we're okay. good to go. Okay, great. Um, so the, we say the club is the world's leading professional organization for journalists, um, and that's a lot. It doesn't fit on a you know bumper sticker, 
um, but it, it really does speak to our, our mission. So we're a place where journalists can work. We're a place they can train to become better at their craft. And uh, we try to um, set a standard for the profession in general. Uh, so it is, a, it is a club, but it also has this kind of mission. And uh, some facts about us, we're, we were founded in 1908. Um, we have about 3,000 members uh, and the size of the facility is 54,000 square feet. And you can see there what we have within this, within this space. And we're about two blocks from the White House. Uh, we're at 14th and F streets. So just uh, very close to Treasury and then the White House is right beyond there. And we're known for our newsmaker luncheons and for, for training, as I said, and for press freedom campaigns, which I, I'll talk a little bit about in a minute. Uh, that's sort of a important societal function that we fulfill. I should also say staff. Um, we, have, we have in non-COVID times about 115 staff and for size of the enterprise, you know, operating budget is about 15 million a year. So this is what the National Press building looks like. And uh, that corner that you see in front of you is 14th and F. And in uh, 1926, the club built the building. And we'd been in, in a number of different places from 1908 to 1926. And we occupy that 13th floor and the 14th floor and, a, and a, about 10,000 square feet that we rent on the fourth floor. And uh, typically rooms that you might see at the club, the, the one that you would be most familiar is the ballroom, uh, the NPC ballroom, which holds about 300 people for dinner. Uh, this is a room where we have uh, our, our newsmaker luncheon series. And uh, so if you watch C-SPAN, um, even under the pandemic, if you watch C-SPAN, you probably need more to do in your life. But if you do watch it, you'll probably see us, uh, uh, the National Press Club, hosting senators or uh, uh, business leaders or um, musicians, artists, that sort of thing. And uh, they, they give a speech and then they take questions. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the bar, which is sort of the heart and soul of the press club. Um, as you can see, we have glasses. <laughs> I don't know why I gave you this picture, but uh, the, the, the bar in the past used to be the place that journalists would hang out and relax. It still is, but that's where they would trade stories and uh, teach each other how to be reporters. And um, now more of that happens in classes and online like this and in, in, uh, in more conventional settings, but there still is a lot of uh, learning going on at the bar. I'll just say about the bar and, it, and its historic uh, uh, placement, uh, the, the bar, uh, the reliable source is the first spot that uh, you could buy a drink after prohibition. Uh, it was also the first place that was closed down at Prohibition. Um, Congress received the first legal drinks. Uh, it was beer. The Budweiser Clydesdales went up to Capitol Hill and gave members and their staff uh, beers. Uh, but there were no dollars that changed hands there. This is the first place you could buy, buy a drink. We think that was a thirsty evening. What you're looking at here is called uh, the First Amendment Lounge. And so this is on the 13th floor. And so a, kind of a different uh, lighter and airier space. Uh, this was a porch at one point that we enclosed. Um, and uh, if you look uh, through the windows that are on your left, you look to treasury and you can look to the White House, uh, which is an interesting um, you know, view. And so it's a great place for receptions and that kind of thing. And the First Amendment Lounge, we try to, anytime we have an event that the club is sponsoring about free speech or the First Amendment, we try to have that take place right in this lounge um, here. And then uh, the broadcast studios, these are uh, on the fourth floor. We've got a modern you know, facility there for television production and all the rooms that are upstairs are wired to that facility. And so if people come to have events or if the club has events, uh, we can connect uh, uh, you know, with a camera, with video via fiber to this facility. And then we're connected uh, with full-time fiber to all of the television networks. Uh, so they can begin editing um, video uh, before an event ends if, if that's what they want to do. 
So those are those are some of the facilities that I wanted to show you and some of the things I wanted to highlight. But this is a little bit about uh, how to get in touch with us. I think Caroline will share this with you as well. Uh, that's me. Um, that's my email address. That's a general phone that rings here at the at the club. Uh, our website, which you might want to take a look at, at press.org, is um, uh, updated with lots of uh, 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 information about our, our programs. I'll just say, I think they're you know they're less robust during COVID than they are normally, but. On a, on a uh, typical year, the National Press Club hosts uh, 2,000 events. Maybe a quarter of those are ours, and the rest of them are um, events that the public wants to put on. And then uh, and for that, they pay fees and, and that sort of thing. But our members uh, appreciate that because then they can work. They can go cover news conferences right, right here in their club. And then the last uh, part is Twitter. We have a Twitter feed. and. Uh, um, we're frequently commenting upon things in the news, including press freedom issues. And so you might want to look at that if you're interested in, in those sorts of things. Um, I, think I'll, I think I'll stop there. And then I understand we're going to have more presentations and then questions after. Great. Thank you so much, William. We appreciate that. I'm going to now send it over to Sarah Ford from Army and Navy Club. She is pretty much right down the street. These are all city clubs in DC and are all very, very close to each other, uh, but have su such different purposes. So we'll learn more about uh, Army and Navy Club. Take it away, Sarah. Hi, thank you everybody. I'm so excited to be here and I get to talk about one of my favorite things, which is this club and the whole reason I am in DC. So I am going to start sharing this screen here. And didn't look like it worked. Let's see if I can move my. You just have to pick the other screen. There you did go. That, did that work? Yes, you're good okay. to go. <laughs> So again, Sarah Ford from the Army and Navy Club. I am a relatively new general manager. Um, new, I mean, I started on January 1st of 2020 and little did I know uh, what this year was going to entail. And uh, certainly wasn't expecting this, but uh, I've, I've learned a lot and I am going to continue to learn a lot just as I'm sure as everyone else has during these kind of crazy times we're going through. A little bit about me, I uh, graduated at the Rutgers University with a BS in finance, so I am not a hospitality major and unfortunately did not have that wonderful background that a lot of you have, but um, I also did not start off in club management and, and operations. I was a director of finance, a CFO at, um, at different clubs, so I kind of went the uh, non-traditional traditional route to a GM. Um, I received my Certificate of Hospitality of County Executive, uh, CHAE, from HFTP. If uh, no one knows what that is, I encourage you to look them up and get your directors of finances and CFOs involved in HFTP. It is the equivalent of CMAA for your accountants and your um, financial professionals and your technology professionals at your club, and also leads a whole other uh, path for club management if you'd like. Uh, work experience, I again, not traditional club background or hospitality. I uh, started at a nonprofit, went into banking when I was get, uh, pursuing my finance degree. And um, I don't know if anyone remembers what happened in banking in 2009, but that was the year I graduated and banks weren't doing so hot. So I ended up um, at a bank that was sold um, and it kind of went under and it was sold to another bank and that's how I ended up in hospitality and in accounting and I started out as the director of finance at the Doylestown Country Club in Pennsylvania, which is a, a suburb um, of Philadelphia. A uh, recruiter contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in moving to Washington DC and interviewing at this place called the Army and Navy Club. The moment I walked in the door, I, I knew it was the place that I was meant to be, and I've been here for three years now. 
a little bit about the Army and Navy Club. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the directors. They're the ones who keep this place going. Um, my director of human resources, Mr. Mark Peckham. Liz Jeske is the director of membership and marketing. Raquel is the director of finance who took my place um, when I moved up to general manager. Tibor is the director of house operations. Mr. Patrick Grady, amazing food and beverage director. Same thing, our executive chef, uh, Chef Deloach, incredible. And our club libra librarian, uh, Will Anderson, also relatively new, but he's doing great things in the library. A little about the club. Um, we began in 1885 in a rented room in someone's house. It was incorporated as the United Service Club in 1885. And since then, the club has grown. They reincorporated as what our name currently is, the Army and Navy Club in 1891. Uh, there was an unfortunate fire that happened many years later. So the clubhouse was again relocated to our current location. Um, and there was a remodel of this current location in uh, 1986. And just a side note to that, uh, President Ronald Reagan dedicated the clubhouse um, after the remodel in, in 1986. So that was kind of a neat little piece of history. We have over 5,000 members. They live all around the world. And our categories and membership include our regular members, which are either active, non-active or retired or newly commissioned. We have a foreign diplomat category. Uh, so for foreign service officers, um, attaches, um, that nature. Uh, we also have associate memberships, which are civilian and non-military. So if you have a military background, if you're interested in military, if you're military adjacent, um, you are able to join the Army and Navy Club. Um, again, that the associate category is very small, uh, but you don't necessarily have to be a military officer to become a member at the Army and Navy Club. We also have a category for our officers, widows or widowers, that they may maintain the membership should the, the member uh, pass away. So what about the Army and Navy Club? What sets us apart and why do our members join here? I would say the main reason our members join is the camaraderie uh, that they no longer have once they're out of service or the camaraderie that they have when they're in service serving with other active. And that means as soon as they walk into the door, they have one thing in common with every other member. And it's not difficult for them to strike up a conversation either by their related military service or uh, things that they have experienced in their life. So uh, really what draws people to this club is that mutual connection and mutually shared experiences. The club has a very large emphasis on military history, uh, military education. We, we do a lot of book forums. This year we've presented over 70 virtual events um, on the majority military, but also some fun social events as well. Military education, again, the artwork here is, is pretty incredible. I'll talk about the library just a bit later, but, um, and the heritage of the military. Our service staff, uh, our, we have a very tenured service staff. Um, that's not to say we don't, you know, have new hires as well, but um, we have well, our longest term employee has been here for I believe it is 65 years. So that's pretty incredible. Um, our motto at the service level is serving those who serve. There's a lot of member recognition. There's rank recognition. Um, as soon as you walk in the door, if you're in a military uniform, our staff knows uh, your rank by the dressings on your uniform. And uh, that's very important. We are, as far as social clubs in any city, we're in a very affordable option. Uh, military sometimes aren't the highest paid people, even though they do a very important job. So one of the main goals for the Army and Navy Club membership committee and board of governors is to maintain an affordable option um, in, a, in a very 
what would be normally a pricey neighborhood. Uh, we are on 17th and I Street, located uh, two blocks from the White House, and um, it's a it's a it's a great location this year. It's uh, we've experienced some uncertainty in the area, but uh, it is a terrific location for for people who work around uh, work around the club. We have over 200 reciprocal clubs in our network all around the world. Again, because military are highly mobile, uh, we have to have clubs which are convenient to everyone. So we have a very wide network of reciprocal clubs. Our dining is first class. Our executive chef has uh, new menus every season. We have a rooftop that is um, pretty neat that has our own uh, produce seasonally. Uh, we are considered the home away from home, meaning when our members have to travel, when they are stationed overseas, when they're stationed in other states, this club remains the same. We are a constant in their life. And when they come to this club, they feel they are at home. They see the same faces. Um, a lot of, uh, again, back to the camaraderie happens here. And we are a constant in their life that may be um, kind of changing day by day. We've also had recent designations of Platinum Club of the World and most recently Platinum Club of America um, City Clubs. So I'll just go through real quick some of our club amenities. Again, we have the, the clubhouse located on 17th and I Street. We have six floors of the Army and Navy building two subterranean floors and four floors uh, that are ground level and above. We have uh, dining services. We have clubs within a club. Um, we host a lot of private, private events. Uh, we have, again, over 200 reciprocal clubs and we do a lot of special events for our members. Here's some pictures of the clubhouse. Um, as you walk in the front door, you walk into the main lobby area, which is the big picture in the middle. And then we have some pictures of our overnight rooms. We have our traditional rooms, uh, which is the red four poster bed. And then we have three suites, which on the left side of the screen are our more updated um, kind of rooms for, for rent. The next slide is our uh, gym. Unfortunately, this has been closed all year because we did just do a full remodel with state-of-the-art equipment. Um, but when we get to reopen it, it will continue to be state of the art. <laughs> uh, we have a mirror fitness, a Peloton bike, and again, um, a TRX training zone. Our, our members love the remodeled gym and fitness center, and we are excited to reopen that soon. A little bit about our library. This is a big draw for our members and even non-members alike. The library has over 20,000 titles and it is the largest private collection of military literature in the world. Uh, the facility also has a business center and is staffed full time by our librarian, Mr. Will Anderson. So we do a lot of filmings here for um, interviews, military documentaries, and um, it is part of the club, but it is also its separate entity, meaning it is a tax exempt organization and tax exempt, ta um, donations to the library are tax exempt um, for our members and other donors. We have three dining outlets. On the left is the main dining room, which is the big draw for most members. Um, the windows to the right overlook Farragut Square and lots of business luncheons, uh, things of that nature go on here and, and main dining uh, dinners at night. The picture to the right is our Daiquiri Lounge that is upstairs on the second floor. And um, it's more of a relaxed atmosphere. Um, the bar actually does not allow to have bar stools at it right now, but other than that, it basically looks, looks the same. Again, beautiful view, views overlooking uh, Farragut Square. And on the bottom is our Eagle Grill, which is on the basement level of the club. It's more relaxed. A coat is not required. Um, that is a seasonal seasonal restaurant. There's just some pictures of our rooftop garden that we have fresh produce. 
from seasonally that we like to include in our menus and some other uh, delicious options our chef has created, including a daiquiri in the top right corner. And then we have switched to a few meatless options with the Beyond Burger uh, debuting last year. We do a lot of private events in the main dining room and in our ballrooms. We have uh, six private dining rooms upstairs. We that host is. things such as pinning ceremonies, even baby showers, um, retirement ceremonies. A big draw is our ballroom and our main dining room for weddings. Absolutely gorgeous venue for that. And um, again, our, our regular member events, which is a huge benefit of being a, a member here. We have rooftop happy hours where we rent the rooftop space um, from the owners and have our members congregate, dine and, and drink with us on the rooftop. Um, spring fashion show for our female members. Um, we have monthly events for um, Things like in March, celebrating women's role uh, as of success in the military. Um, we have African American uh, Military History Month event, uh, lots of book forums, and basically an event for every um, holiday on, on the books here. We have a large network of clubs within the club, meaning our members have decided that they have found a niche in within the club and they'd like to get with other members who enjoy those same things. So the Fox Connor Society, the chess group, travel club, um, ANC golf club. We have a very large population of our members who live in Texas. So they have created their own club within a club for the Texas members. And recently we started a wine society. Some pictures of our reciprocal clubs around the world. And this is our website and our social media um, at Army Navy Club DC on Instagram, at Army Navy Club DC on Facebook, and search for the Army Navy Club on LinkedIn. And this is just a picture of our app in the middle here. And then to the website on the right, it shows how you would log in as a member to uh, view and register for things online. So that is about it. Sorry if I ran over my time. I get so excited talking about my club. I could go on for days, but thank you for, for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Sarah. Your passion is definitely uh, seen and known uh, here through your presentation. We appreciate that. Our final club that we're going to tour today is Capitol Hill Club. And uh, Gina, you are up. Gina, be sure to unmute. There you go. Thank you, Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> so it's great to see everyone here today and to join you and talk about our club. Uh, we are um, in a very unique position uh, in terms of our clubhouse location and uh, who we are, our foundation and in Washington, DC. And so I'll talk to you about our membership and community and our legacy. Uh, we are the National Republican Club of Capitol Hill and our nickname is the Capitol Hill Club. We um, uh, host two restaurants and 14 private dining rooms. The concept of our club um, was founded in 1950 by a New Jersey Congressman, James Auchincloss. He uh, and a hundred founding members from 22 states, all Republicans form the nucleus of what has become our premier political club. 11 years later, um, the club moved from the Dewey House uh, to more spacious headquarters at the Congressional Hotel at 75 C Street. Uh, both of those locations no longer stand. And in 1971, we broke ground to our 
Clubhouse at 300 First Street, uh, just across the street from the Cannon House Office Building, Madison Building on the Library of Congress, and um, one block from the Capitol. And I should be clicking through. There we are. Awesome. So and be sure and, to share um, your screen to us. You're not, you're not seeing it? No. Not at all? No. Hmm. That's so weird. You're seeing, uh, let's see. There we are. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go back uh, to our location here. Uh, here are the Capitol grounds and uh, we are right here. So across the street from the Metro and the Cannon House office building. So quite central to um, a lot going on in the Hill. Here is a picture of the Dewey House. It was at 214 C Street. Um, we have the original door from the Dewey House. There's a 75 on it. When we moved to the 75 C Street location, we took the door with us. And after breaking ground, um, the first lady at the time, Mrs. Nixon, helped lay the cornerstone to our clubhouse today. So five stories um, here on the corner of First and C Street Southeast. All right. Our members uh, are compromised of um, many influential people, including presidents, vice presidents, Republican members of Congress, governors, state party leaders, and Republicans everywhere. We do have a non-discrimination clause, so you do not need to be a Republican to join our club. And in fact, we have many um, independents and Democrats who are members of our club. Guests also include members from both sides of the aisle, celebrities and international leaders. Um, our club membership is of course by invitation only and our only requirements are that two current members must sponsor any new invitees. Uh, benefits of membership including access to dining, which is um, a presidential dining room, which is a little bit more formal than the grill room. Our grill room is definitely the heart of the club as that is where our bar is, so. Um, we do offer special events, um, mostly Epicurean adventures and dining. So lobster nights, um, burger nights, steak nights. Other events include our virtual series, which has been very popular. So we've gotten some leaders to talk to our members about the election most recently. This morning, we hosted four of the newly elected members of Congress uh, to do a little Q&A session and intro to our members. So we had several hundred club members dial into that, which was great. We also host uh, winemaker dinners. We've done that virtual and uh, in person, which was kind of fun. And we of course rely on volunteers to help us with that. We also fundraise for the club, uh, which puts us in a very unique position. So one, uh, firstly, because we have a gift ban exemption on the house side. So we can invite members of Congress to our events. And I think that makes us super unique because the only other club I know who has that is the Democratic Club. Um, and so we do host fundraisers to raise money for the club and we have never had assessments for our members, which I think our members appreciate. Uh, we do send out invitations to these events. And then of course, in the 14 private dining rooms, there are private events going in and out. So pre-COVID time, in an in-session day where the house is in session, we could have up to 700 people through the door. With COVID um, or on an out-of-session day, it's closer to about 125. So we also have a reciprocal club network um, that a lot of our members really enjoy taking advantage of. All right, our clubhouse is decorated in the Federalist style and has the largest collection outside of the Library of Congress of judge prints in the world. And these are a collection of political cartoons from 1880 to 1930. The Eisenhower Lounge pictured here boasts um, 458 elephants from our club's collection, which was started by our longtime bartender. He was uh, one of our bartenders, Mr. George Thompson for over 30 years and he would travel on his vacations and our club members would travel all over the world and bring him elephants. And so we have over 600 elephants throughout the clubhouse. And I'll show you a picture of that. We also have our precious 1887 uh, Steinway in this room. So we have various curio cabinets too of the elephants as well as some congressional baseball trophies. 
All righty. So this is a picture of the Eisenhower Lounge set up for reception. Here are some of the, the cabinets a little closer up. Um, what's really nice is a few of the elephants have little dedications to them or in, are in memory uh, for someone. And we were happy to accept the collection from our bartender. We do keep our piano tuned. In fact, we have a young man who practices regularly. And so it's a nice touch, of course, to always have that piano. Some of the judge prints I talked about were donated to us by a life member of the club. This is one of the oldest ones. This is not a judge print um, from the Lincoln um, campaign 1856. We also have the NAST collection, which um, is the metamorphosis of the elephant being the symbol for the GOP. And that started in 1871 through 1885 through up here. So in various areas of the club, we host um, these cartoons as gifts from our life member. And there's some little history tidbits added included. So it's kind of fun. So our community um, of working professionals and leaders who make up our members are mostly driven by members of Congress on the House side. So when I tell our, when people ask, or someone asked me, um, how many House members are club members? So of the Republican club members, 98% of them. So of the 200, so 196 of them are club members, which means they pay dues and they use the club, et cetera. On the Senate side though, we only have seven. So of the 52 from this last cycle. So um, even though it's only five blocks away, the Senate just seems so very far. <laughs> and it's a different kind of animal too, politically, because the senators are in office for six years, whereas members of Congress on the House side are every two years in the election cycle. And so they have a lot more fundraising to do, a lot more, a lot more work to be done in those two years. So we support um, our members um, through creating a great space for them where they can meet. Unlike Williams Club, uh, we have a no media policy. So when when cameras come through the door, they call me to stop them because <laughs> it's not allowed. We don't even book press conferences any longer. It's, you know, we want to be sure that our members do feel safe and, you know, have a space where they can talk freely. And that's very important. Uh, throughout different events, we obviously um, have a lot of visitors and guests from all over the world for fly-ins to other. Uh, we have some international members, of course, from um the canadian parliament we have two who are club members and so we want to make sure that we are uh, like sarah said a home away from home much like her club uh, for our members where they can stay productive and, and take meetings and another valuable part of that club uh, of us being here is that members of congress can do political business here that they can't do in their office and so that's why we're so important uh being right across the street some of the services and amenities we offer include our char mobile charging stations, Wi-Fi, of course, discounts at local overnight accommodations, valet parking, shoe shine. Uh, we do offer complimentary room rentals. We have a food and beverage minimum attached to them. So that's a nice benefit from even, um, event planners. We offer complimentary appetizers and highly addictive popcorn. We have birthday perks and daily periodicals. Uh, as well as we offer networking, business, educational, and cultural programs. Here's a photo of the Bolton Room, named after Frances Bolton. Uh, her husband, Chester Bolton, served the great state of Ohio. He died while in office. She took over and then was voted in another 22 years, so 11 terms. She was very instrumental in selling the first 100 life memberships to members of Congress. And so we honor the Boltons with the named room. Uh, this is a, a good shot of our third floor meeting room. So they're opened up to each other and we have seven total. Um, we did a renovations in 2016 where we took five rooms and made it seven because we found that the need for smaller meeting space was, was higher. And uh, with the COVID restrictions to 10 people starting next week, we're we're happy that we can accommodate those much smaller meetings in our in our space here. All right, 
of the uh, dining um, outlets, presidential dining room has kind of become king during COVID. So normally the dining room would be closed for breakfast, um, lunch and dinner when the house is out of session. We're heavily affected by the congressional schedule. But because it's a much larger space, we can accommodate 225. So up the spiral staircase has been kind of our headquarters for all dining um, since we reopened in June. Uh, we only offered carry out from March to June 24th. The presidential dining room is also um, available for weddings. And what's really nice is we are closed on the weekends. And so club members can get the run of the clubhouse and have functions on various floors. Now the grove room, as I mentioned earlier, is the heart of the club. Uh, I don't have a photo of it, but behind here is our bar. And so that's where members love to hopnob and kind of congregate and meet and greet. And so this is a photo at full capacity. Next to our grill room, here is the entrance to the 75 room. It's a soft seating area. And so this is always first come first serve, whereas the dining room reservations are highly recommended. And so um, normally this would always be open when the club's open. However, we have switched that around. Now, part of our legacy, of course, is a lot of national leaders, you know, just in members of Congress. So Whip Scalise um, is a great friend of the club. President Bush was a life member and we happen to have this famous portrait here in our lobby. Um, I'm a huge Teddy fan. So I added this picture for my own joy to, <laughs> to smile for this. Uh, Speaker Ryan, um, Speaker Boehner, um, all of them are doing business here every day in the club, especially the, the uh, current leadership. And that's important. And we have a great um, um, partnership with them because they have done virtual, these virtual briefings I talked about. So while the Republican Foundation is unique in our service, it's um, again, not a requirement, but a lot of history is made here and it's, it's really fun. Every day is different. I started my hospitality career. Well, I graduated political science, so this was natural. But I started my hospitality career in, with Starwood Hotels. And then I gravitated through the club through a unique partnership. And I'm newly back here going on 10 years again, the second time around, so really fun. So what can I show you that makes us special? <laughs> um, we, because we are so unique and we have so many guests, um, there's a lot of things that happen here that we don't talk about, obviously, like many clubs. Uh, but it's from a political perspective, it's fascinating to see roll out. So four years ago, over four, four and a half years ago, you know, we saw the secret meetings that, well, they, we were hosting Trump meeting with Speaker Ryan and uh, Priebus, who at the time was the RNC chair. And this was four months before um, he won at the convention. So um, the John Boehner smoking patio, because we are a non-smoking club, but there, there is a special patio for him. And um, just uh, our connections, even like this morning Zoom with the newly elected members of Congress and how our members uh, do a lot of their job just by connecting with them and reaching out to their chief of staff and looking for those introductions. And so it's a, it's a big, huge political animal going on here. And that's, uh, that's what makes us so unique. All right, that's everything. Wonderful, wow. thank you, Gina. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. So we've had some questions come in and uh, the first one was about uh, asking about backgrounds for Gina and William. Could you share a little bit about how you got to your current position and how long you've been at your current club? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I mentioned that uh, I worked for Starwood Hotels, but what was interesting is um, I came to Washington DC via internship and um, I, it was my senior semester and I told my parents I wasn't moving back home and I got a job managing a church house. So the uh, a church, church of the Brethren has a house on the hill and they needed a house manager and I needed a free place to stay. So I stayed on and I temped for a while a couple months and I ended up working for FTD. That's the, uh, the Florist Association. So they had two lobbyists and a grassroots manager here in DC and they were two blocks from the church house. And I said, oh, I want this job. So they hired me as their office manager. So it was really great 
uh, working for um, two lobbyists at the time and, and learning everything going on, which is where I thought my passion was with uh, a political science degree. So my boss at the time was on the board of the club. And fast forward about a year later, she's still on the board of the club. However, our satellite office is being shut down. So I get a job on K Street, uh, which I quickly learned I do not like. So <laughs> I worked some for some for, with some pretty notorious figures, and there were a lot of you know nights not for me at the Palm, but other things going on, and it was just so interesting to see that whole other side. And so I was like, oh, not really into it. I was playing soccer with a Starwood uh, HR director, and she said, oh, our general manager is looking for an assistant. I said, I can do that. I work for these guys. I can do anything. So, <laughs> so that's how I got to Starwood. And I spent a year as an executive assistant. And then um, I get a call from my old boss saying that Starwood just signed a contract with the Capitol Hill Club. I said, what? That doesn't make any sense. But long time GN had left. The club leadership decided they needed um, to bring on some stronger outside management and consulting to take the club to you know, the next level and um, the membership director was leaving. And so she submitted my name and resume. I, and um, I got transferred as a Starwood employee to the club. And I stayed there for over four years when the contract was ending. Um, I decided to stay with Starwood and I moved to be a sales manager for two years at a hotel. Uh, and then I got promoted to office manager at a large all suite property in Old Town Alexandria. And I was promoted uh, to the rooms division director there. So after a few years there, I moved to the luxury collection, uh, the Fairfax, which is in DuPont Circle, which was then part of the, the luxury collection. And it was the first Ritz Carlton built um, in the city. So really, really great hotel background. I had tons of corporate training, Six Sigma. I was a property service culture trainer. So I was responsible for training like 90% of, of all the staff throughout the hotel, which I was really passionate about on branding uh, for the Sheraton and the luxury collection. And so then I decided I was going to move to New Orleans because if I was going to work this hard, I wanted to like play that hard. <laughs> so um, I go to New Orleans for the first time. I have an amazing time. Go a second time. I start talking to other hotels and then Stan calls me, my old GM here at the club. And I'm like, He's like, Melissa's leaving, you wanna come back? And I was like, wow. So, and that was nine years ago. So full circle, a lot of, every one of my jobs was because of someone I worked with and I got tapped to the next connection. So very exciting kind of career path for me. I've lived on the Hill all these years. And so it's great to have a one mile commute. In fact, uh, for the four years I had a smart car so I could always find parking because parking is a nightmare on the Hill. But with a smart car, you can park it anywhere. So, but with COVID, I have traded that in for an SUV and um, I'm doing okay with parking. <laughs> so thank you for your question. Awesome, very good. Uh, you know, and I think a lot of these uh, webinars that we have done and talk to different managers, you know, since you probably have heard it time and time again, but networking is key and you never know when one chapter ends when that chapter may reopen and you may come back. Uh, I am uh, in that same boat. I interned at Cosmos Club and, and came back myself. So we do hear those stories often, you know, not to burn any bridges, uh, but a lot of times where you may have worked in the beginning of your career, you could come back to. So keep that in mind as you um, start your careers uh, when you graduate. William, can you give us a little bit of back background about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, studied English in college at Vanderbilt University and, and then uh, graduate school at Brown University. And I went out uh, and worked in journalism and public relations kinds of jobs for a while. And um, in 1986, moved to Washington from New York uh, with the idea of starting a company. And um, that company was called US Newswire. So it was a wire service that transmitted news releases for government, interest groups, trade associations, think tanks. Uh, ran that for 20 years, um, sold it, um, was at a fellowship um, with my family, which is a cool experience for one year, when I got called by the club 
Now, I had been a member of the club uh, since 1986 when I moved to Washington, and um, they needed some help looking for the next my position. And you know, I was known to them for a lot of reasons. And so I had some business background and um, I was on kind of a committee doing the search. And at some point they asked me, well, you know, would you consider the, the position? So um, I thought about it and I really liked the club experience and I liked the mission of this organization. So I started in uh, here in uh, 2007 and it, it's, it's not uh, that normal for a member to become the uh, lead staff person of a, of a club, but it, I think it does happen occasionally. And um, so 2007, I've been here uh, since then. And um, I would say that the, uh, from the business standpoint, the press club, uh, which has always been a fun, historic and interesting place was, was kind of a turnaround uh, situation. So um, it is a business. The dues for members is, are extremely low. So the business has to run uh, at a good uh, margin to support the club for the members. And um, so that's a little different than most clubs. Anyway, that's my, that's kind of my background. I'm a, a you know, business person. Uh, I know the news and media side, that's pretty important for here. And I know the events side as well. Wow, that's such an interesting background. We do definitely don't hear that every day. Can you talk a little bit about how your members become members uh, of your club? It's definitely unique. As Gina said, there's no press. A lot of our clubs, we do not have press in the door. And so yeah. very different uh, very over different. there. And what do you have to, to do or be involved with? Well, you apply, membership uh, categories? you apply. And just like with Gina's club, you we ask that you, um, you know, be uh recommended by members. Um, there are times where that, you know, that doesn't happen. We have considered people who don't have that, um, particularly if they have a strong uh, and known to us uh, press background. Um, but we, our preference is we have, uh, we have sponsors. Um, and then the charter of the club says that uh, it has to be 55% uh, um, uh, working journalists. So we have some retired and we have some PR people and things like that. Um, and so uh, uh, the application process is uh, you submit, uh, it's reviewed by uh, uh, a team of members. And what they're really looking for is to determine, um, you know, is this person, is this somebody that we want to, as a member and are they in the right uh, category? So uh, oftentimes someone will apply as a journalist member and the journalist members are the ones that vote and are the officers and things like that. The, the PR members, uh, are very important to the club, but they don't they don't vote or they can't be the president that sort of thing, and so um, it's a rigorous process. And you know, you can it used to be pretty cut and dried who's a journalist and who isn't a journalist, but now it's it's a little complicated. There's blogging and there's you know uh, all kinds of things, and so we have a sort of a standard that we're trying to see that's met. Uh, it should be a publication that uh, 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 makes its living uh, by uh, advertising or circulation or some combination of those. Um, so uh, um, some uh, magazine could be a very good magazine, but is fully paid by an organization, even a, a you know, a really good organization. That, that's not something we would consider a journalist, but they, they could come in under other categories. Um, so that's, that's our process. Uh, the members are the best ones at recruiting, although we have a, we have a membership uh, team that, that recruits and um, tries to make sure that uh, journalists, uh, you know, know what it means to be a, a, a club member and what kind of benefits you get and, and uh, what kind of values there are. And I would tell you, I really didn't hit this hard in my presentation, but just like the other clubs, networking is a really big thing. And so uh, uh, people join the club because uh, in journalism, you, you have to be aware that you may be uh, changing jobs during your career. Um, and so this is a great place to meet your next boss, that sort of thing. Awesome. Do you, for all three clubs, uh, is there categories based on age or? Uh, yeah, are, for us. Okay, there are. And how many different categories? Uh, well, we have an under 35, you get a, a significant price break. Uh, once you hit uh, 36, you know, have to pay regular dues. And uh, then when you um, retire, which is also a, what does that mean? But when you, when you uh, 
have retired from your job and you tell us that you're retired, meaning you're not going on to a different thing, um, uh, you, you'll get a, a retired dues status. Great. How about Sarah at your club? We, we do, but because of inurement, we don't make it age-based. It, it's actually a newly commissioned officer and normally a newly commissioned officer is not going to be in his 60s. So um, it's unofficial, but it's basically, it's, it's official. So newly commissioned, commissioned, and then um, either retired. So a lot of our members fall into those categories by age, but uh, it's, it's not an official category by number. Great, and that makes your club really unique that it is based on officer status. Uh, we definitely don't hear that very often. So. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> this is why we're doing this virtual tour because we're, we're getting from all of you such unique pieces to the club that I think a lot of students haven't heard before. So this is really great. Gina, how about your club? So we have two membership categories. We have individual memberships, which are graduated by age. And then we have the firm membership. So on the individual memberships, you can join the club when you are 21 years of age. So we have junior membership, 21 to 31 teacher resident 32 through 34, and then resident levels off at uh, 35. Uh, and that is um, in parallel to non-resident status or government. We offer a government uh, discount and we also have non-resident membership. So you can't have a home or office within 75 miles of the club to qualify for that, that membership category. On the firm side, the firm memberships are more of an investment in membership. And so if you think about uh, large corporations or organizations that always have lobbyists and may have a lot of turnover, um, so the membership designee can be changed without any new fee. And when you have multiple members of an organization, um, we offer a discount as well. And that's a really popular category. About a third of our members are non-resident and a third are firm. Great, thank you. So an interesting question come through, you know, country clubs uh, and standard clubs that I think a lot of our students are familiar with have some type of seasonality. With your three clubs being in DC and in a city, do you see any seasonality? Uh, or is it pretty constant throughout the year uh, with staff levels and, and business? We definitely have um, a schedule because we're so heavily affected by the congressional schedule. And so when the house is in session, approximately three weeks of the month, we're in full operation. Whereas um, the one week that they're not in session on average for the month, then we only have one restaurant open rather than both because those business levels, again, will go from 600 to 700 to about 150. We, during COVID times, that has completely squashed everything again, but in normal, the congressional calendar uh, is anticipated. It's published at the beginning of the year. There's rarely any changes. So we also take a two week break in August where we close down and we schedule uh, some important maintenance or capital improvements. And then we also take the two weeks off between Christmas and New Year's like the week before Christmas. So we'll close on the 18th um, through um, coming back on swearing in day, which happens to be a Sunday, uh, January 3rd. Now, um, when you think about private clubs, like why wouldn't we have a huge, you know, Christmas dinner or New Year's party? Um, we took a survey, uh, we surveyed our members very thoroughly um, years ago, and most of them have memberships at other clubs at golf clubs, you know, and, and that's where, that's the social part, but because their membership with our club is so work focused and political, um, we don't have the pressure to have to serve our members over the holidays. Now for Thanksgiving, we did a pick up turkey and, and things like that. We do an Easter brunch, which is a really big event, uh, but we are able to close for those uh, four weeks throughout the year and then to, to streamline and slim down our operation when, um, when they're just not across the street and we're not getting that traffic. Great, thank you. William, how about yourself and your- uh, Kind of similar. I mean, you know, journalists wanna cover uh, members of Congress and, and what's going on. And so when the, when the members leave the city and uh, of course then the, some of the lobbyists and uh, the interest groups are also gonna leave, take their vacation then, you know, 
There's le less for the press to do. So we're slowest. We're not closed that like um, like Tableau Club on those times, but we're uh, we're slowest at um, the August, those two weeks or so in August, and the uh, and the uh, the end of the year. And similarly, uh, we don't um, you know we did we did uh, pick up turkey, but we don't do uh, uh, we're closed at Christmas. We're closed uh, those kind of holidays. Great, thank you, Sarah. How about yourself? Uh, I will echo that August is particularly slow at the club too. Um, and along with Congress being out of session and not a lot to cover news wise, um, a lot of people just aren't coming to downtown and anyone who lives in the area, which all of you mostly do, you know, August is not uh, great walking around weather in the district. So um, I think, I think the, the soupy weather probably keeps a lot of people from um, just meandering about and coming downtown, but um, we don't officially close at all. We reduce our dining outlets for the seasonality and um, we'll reduce our, our hours and some of our uh, dining, but we don't um, ever really close. We do offer each of the, the events for holidays um, because we do have some service members who have families in the area. Uh, who like to spend their their time here home away from home and they'll have their out of town guests stay at the club in our overnight rooms so um we do always have people here perpetually around the year but it does significant significantly slow down in in august great we had a question specifically for you sarah about uh being located on farragut square and what that's been like lately uh is the area still being used as bm blm plaza and what's what have, what's what have you had to navigate with that this is my favorite question because this was my entire life for three months starting back in uh may and june um 16th street which is the street right behind us is black lives matter plaza um, located on 16th uh, and I, and for a while, the mayor had shut down the entire I Street, so our members could not even get to us by vehicle. Um, since then, they've allowed through traffic, but um, the, the St. Regis, which is located on 16th Street, and the Hay Adams, which is on the other side of 16th Street, um, you still cannot travel to them by vehicle. It's, it's very difficult. Uh, a lot of protests in the area. Um, I saw some, and I'm sure you've all saw it on the news, but the club was shut down during the first really big protest, which actually turned violent. It ended up not being a protest at all. It ended up just being rioting. Um, the protesters were in one area and then other people started joining in that had nothing to do with protests and it turned very violent and got um, very disturbing. I had a front row seat to that. Um, I now know what tear gas smells like and I know where to turn off the air intake in our building, which I did not know prior. Um, so the tear gas does not get sucked in from the air intake. Um, I've, I, there were people that were beaten down in the streets. Um, there were cops that were beaten down in the streets. I mean, it, it has been a very, very interesting year. And, and I've seen some great great things and great things come and I've seen some not so great things, but uh, it was very difficult for a while with traffic and getting members here and um, trying to stay open uh, during all of that. But um, I think, you know, some good things have, have come from it and we're starting to see a little bit of reopening, but it is still a major protest center where just day to day, we have to either direct members where to drive and where to park or even meet them on the corner with their takeout order or run across the park and, and try to get them their food. So uh, it's, it's really been kind of fly by, you know, figure it out as you go, <laughs> but we've got plans for most of it now. Absolutely, I think all of our clubs have had to pivot. They might look a little bit different, but uh, I'd like to know more about, you know, what are you most proud of with your teams and how they have pivoted? You know, we generally know all of us are following CDC guidelines, uh, we're following, you know, what the mayor and the DC health department are sending us. But in terms of what your team has done to set your club apart and to uh, encourage members to continue to be members during this difficult time, can you talk a little bit about something uh, you're proud of? 
in the beginning of COVID, we um, were delivering um, food and uh, doing shopping for our members who were mostly on the older side, but or sometimes just, uh, you know, they had some other reason why they, they couldn't go in, into a grocery store or into public. And it was great to see staff do that. Um, lately, over the summer, we started a, a program uh, to use our, our kitchen here uh, in the program called Help the Heroes. And in, in this, what we do is make, um, make meals uh, that are to-go meals, and we take them once a day over to uh, Howard University Hospital. And these are meals for the nurses and other frontline medical workers. And we have uh, uh, members and others make donations uh, into a fund, and we, we use that fund to retire the food cost and the, and the labor cost. Um, so the, the, the restaurant, the indoor dining is, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty light traffic. Um, so this was a way to help do something good in the community and keep the, uh, and keep the um, you know, staff, you know, uh, do, doing what they do best. So I've been really pleased with how all of that's working. Great, thank you. Gina, how about there? We have, um, we started with carry out from March. We still are doing, uh, offering carry out. We, we're offering um, provisions. So like deli meats, uh, produce and, and toilet paper even, because we had like 600 rolls in house. So, uh, so early on, you know, like, we were able to offer that. Um, and we still do offer a good provisions menu. Um, we developed uh, an app for our members to make it easier to order carry out and kind of streamline that system. I think overall the feedback we've gotten from our members, and this is uh, due to our leadership, is that we're communicating as much as possible. So there's a monthly missive from the club president showing what we're doing, showing you know, I think I want to say like the April edition has me with a vacuum cleaner on my back and I'm literally vacuuming the club, you know, and so we really just, you know, put on whatever hat we needed to put on to keep going when we were at the essential managers numbers, which was um, originally six for us and then changed to eight with the the carry out opening up uh, and being so popular. Um, and so, but First and foremost, because again, a lot of our club members are members at other clubs. They they were comparing to what they were hearing and they were just really happy. They were communicating as much as possible. We're thanking our members that they are maintaining their membership. And um, happily, we've only had um, a 5% resignation drop, which is pretty significant considering um, that a lot of our members just haven't walked through the door. But we're adding value with these virtual briefings, um, and so I think I think that we're just doing the best we can, and our members see that, and and that's kind of been part of our success. Great, thank you, Sarah. How about what are you most proud of with your team lately? I, I think it's the um, the coming together and really just figuring out things on the fly. Uh, before this year, we had no virtual presence for membership interaction. Literally, there were none. We would even do board meetings if we had to because of traffic in the area through a telephone conference call. There was no face-to-face -face Zoom. So we went from zero to having 70 virtual events for our normally in-person book forums where um, our membership and marketing manager um, and director have come up with ideas and ways to have presenters and published authors of these military books, you know, present online. Um, and the ideas that they've come up with for, you know, interacting with members from a distanced, you know, way a virtual wine tasting come pick up your cheese and wine at the club go home and then we all connect like like this on zoom so um just the ability to implement that so rapidly and change it on on such a fast scale to keep up with the new mayor's orders which seemed to be coming out every other week at some point in in may and june that um i'm just really impressed by how my entire team just stay on their toes and and uh, come up with with great ideas to fit the the changing seemed like hourly 
uh, events here in the district. That's great. I'm glad to hear all three of your clubs are doing well and doing what is needed to be done uh, in this climate. So I'd like to finish this off unless any other questions come through uh, with, you know, your clubs have all had very interesting speakers and I think that's uh, a highlight at all of your clubs in different ways, but what event or interaction stands out in your mind on a personal level, you know, that you're really proud of that your club has hosted or a person you met that was really fascinating, uh, something that would be fun uh, to finish us off here with. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome, I'll go first. So uh, for COVID times, um, the event we just did was on Saturday and we did a safe distance with Santa. So the team from our, our clubhouse built this eight by eight frame uh, I bought fabric for it so Santa could be seated behind this giant picture frame in a holiday look. And normally we would have 400 attendees for our, our Santa Saturday. Uh, we had about 125 and it was a pickup brunch. We did 15 minutes um, reservations and had like six foot stands. You did a one way path through two floors of the club to make it happen, great communication. Um, and um, it was just great and the kids were so happy. And then we did a Santa Zoom and had our members send in their names uh, of the, the first name of the child and the city they live in so that Santa could give them a shout out on, from the nice list and from his book. So that was really successful and we got a re some really nice photos and, and feedback about that. And then pre-COVID times um, on a whim, you know, when the Stanley Cup came to the White House, uh, they brought it here. You know, and so I had maybe a day's notice, if that, that come and take your picture with the Stanley Cup. And so things like that happen here all the time. You just never know who's coming or what's being offered. And, and we just, we just work to get it done. So that's really fun. That's so, a huge we got to put a baby. Fan. We put a baby in the Stanley Cup and I was dying. <laughs> I'm like, put the baby in the cup. And they have like the best pictures for life, you know? So, so things like that really make, make me happy. We have some great partnerships with the local sports teams and, and the good folks who do the marketing and, uh, and the leadership over there. So it's, it's always fun. Well, I'm definitely jealous of that one as a huge Capitals fan. <laughs> uh, my office is covered with uh, Cap Capitals memorabilia, so pretty cool story. William, how about yourself? No, your we phone? didn't get the Caps trophy this time, but I mean, uh, the Stanley Cup's been here. It's pretty cool. There's a guy that his job pretty much is to follow the cup and, and um, you know, they have, there's a lot of ritual to it. It's fun. We did, we did have the uh, World Series trophy this year uh, at the beginning of the year before the season started and then didn't start. Um, so those are great events, I agree. Uh, I think one of the things that, that the club do, works on is uh, press freedom issues. I mentioned that before. At, at any given time, including right now, um, some journalists and sometimes our members are, are, um, are being held sometimes for a few days in prison, sometimes for longer than that. And uh, the club is an active participant in the um, effort to try to get them out of prison. And um, we're working on the case of uh, former Marine Captain Austin Tice right now. He's been in Syria for eight years. Uh, his parents uh, in August during COVID came, came to visit the club, but through, through Zoom. And we had a, a, a recognition event for the anniversary, his eighth anniversary of being in captivity. There's been a lot of uh, action on that case. We're, we're hopeful, the, you know, the president has been very, uh, has a good track record of getting Americans home. And we're hopeful that there uh, can still be some um, activity there for Austin, you know, uh, either at the end of this um, administration or the beginning of the next one. Um, and personally for me, I, I worked on the Jason Resign case with some members and, and uh, he's a Washington Post reporter who was in prison in Tehran, uh, um, for a couple of years and um, he, he walked uh, free the 16th of January in uh, 2016. And 10 days later, he walked through the club uh, doors to say hello and, and thank us you know, for our efforts. And so um, it's things like that, that we, um, uh, you know, we think are special and that uh, stick with us, stick with me. Well, wow, it's amazing. 
Thank you for your work on that. Sure. Sarah, finish this off here. Um, mine will probably be the least interesting to everybody, but um, I, it, it was very neat for me to meet my first Secretary of the Navy when I first started here. Um, each Secretary of the Navy under the current administration has been here at some point. Um, and so <laughs> there's kind of been some with this um, current president, there's been some turnovers and some high ranking military positions. And that includes the Secretary of the Navy and the Secretary of Defense. So there's been act five acting Secretary of Defense um, since I've worked here and I've gotten to meet four of them. So that was, that's pretty neat, including the um, current uh, Secretary of Defense acting right now and um, all four of the um, Secretary of the Navy. Um, the, the one that stood out to me the most was uh, General Mattis came here and gave an interview for Military Spouse Magazine. And um, I, I read his book. I follow a lot of his, his leadership. Um, and so that was, that was the neatest one for me was, was getting to meet him. Very cool. Well, I hope today you all have been inspired to look past maybe what you knew before and now look at some clubs with uh, different themes, different missions, different purposes, including these three that we highlighted today. You'll see all of the contact information has been up on the screen. So hopefully you've jotted down the information. Uh, if another question comes to you later, uh, Thank you all so much for supporting all of our programming this year. Uh, we wish you a very happy holiday. Thank you to the panelists for their time. We are now gonna finish up. We've got a couple extra minutes. We're going to end the recording and welcome you all to say a personal hello to our speakers, to each other. Uh, networking as we've talked about is just so, so important. Uh, and I think we all could use a, a, a little hello to each other um, to brighten our spirits during this uh, holiday season. So thank you all uh, and uh, happy holiday. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks for organizing. My pleasure. This was awesome. I, I really think they got some 